David, just for intro to introduce you, you happen to be, uh, well, it, the Simeral team uh, at the same place when the World Wide Web was created. And uh, actually, that's that's shocking because uh, you're both, uh, you're actually a particle physicist. Besides, you also are a programmer and also uh, you you actually also create music. So I don't know how you have enjoyed all of this. Uh, <laughs> so, it's really yeah. incredible. I mean, I was a, a particle physicist. It's my degree from MIT. And I, I was actually uh, there at MIT where some events happened. And I actually watched uh, the growth of the web. You know, it, it, most of, the, uh, most of the, the big explosion was when I was actually living in, in Hamburg, uh, Germany, at the DAISY laboratory, where I actually met a lot of your compatriot. Um, Polish, Poland, has, of course, has a very uh, uh, prestigious physics um, history, right? Um, and then later on, as I got tired of the academic race, I, I joined a private company called Version and continued programming in the molecular modeling space where I currently sit. And in that process, I developed a lot of the web technology used at the company, including the laboratory information system. And I'll just talk briefly about that. And I want to give a perspective about you know what the web means to me, how I grew up with it, and what this maybe tells people about what might be coming next in terms of innovation. David, I'm really honored to be your host today. And uh, well, so let's start and uh, let's uh, let's check if your presentation is uh, up and running. Good luck, David. <laughs> My pleasure. So here I'm showing a picture of a particle physics experiment. And so, you know, why am I doing this? Well, part of the reason is, is there's some history here. This is the end station A experiment at Slack. And this experiment actually discovered quarks. It's the one Nobel Prize in 1990. And two members of the Nobel Prize in 1990 were physicists at MIT, were my mentors in my group. And they were able to tell me stories about how this experiment worked. Um, you know, I wasn't actually involved in that, but they told me about uh, things they were doing back then with computers, which is really very fascinating. And the reason why, you know, you might ask yourself, why was the World Wide Web invented in high energy physics? And the reason why is that in high energy physics, you're dealing with some very important some very difficult concepts like data acquisition um, i mean the idea of connecting uh computers to instrumentation was something that was invented in physics numerical analysis of course and most importantly international collaborations in high energy physics collaborations typically span the world and there's a problem of course of communication um, now this is uh the counting house for end station a and i want to show you this because it's kind of it's kind of funny, you look at these instruments on this rack, they're these counters, and there's actually these little tubes. They're called mixer tubes, I think. And what they used to do in the old days before computers is they would actually read these numbers off a rack and write them in a logbook uh, by hand. And when they published the paper, they would you know, do the calculations by hand with actually hand calculators and draw the graphs with rulers, and that's how they published papers. Now, obviously, this is not very efficient compared to, to our standards. And so there was a lot of work in trying to automate this, right? Um, now, the other thing, too, is remember documentation. I mean, these days, if you want to know how something works or get an API, you simply just look it up in the web. In the old days, of course, there was no internet. And so we used to, and I remember this because I worked at this time, we used to have these hard copies of documents. This orange shelf of, of bookcase is actually the VMS documentation. And I was very fortunate to have uh, the shelf in my office. So when I needed to look up something to implement something in a VAX, I can turn around and open up a book. And I would actually do this. Uh, other cases, we would sometimes have copies of documentations on a mainframe and you go to the central printing facility because you didn't have your own printer. And if you're, you know, if you knew how, you can print out the documentation on this little green paper. And we would have these green uh, paper uh, documents on our, on our desks, you know, to look up things like CERN light. In this case, this is a prettier PDF version. So, you know, obviously it's kind of inefficient. I'm working on a project. I want to use a numerical library. I have to open up a book or, you know, find a document. Maybe you have to get up, you know, and go to the library, for example, and look up something. That's not very efficient. So now, <laughs> documentation on demand. Um, so one thing, the first time I used the World Wide Web, and I didn't, of course, realize what I was using, is because I wanted to look up 
documentation on libraries. And I discovered, someone told me about this beautiful thing um, from CERN where you can actually log in or actually just connect and you get these little links. You can see little links with numbers and you can actually look up all the documentations on CERN's computational library. CERN, CERN is, of course, a laboratory in the um, border of Switzerland and France, which does high energy physics. I actually did this on a uh, IBM mainframe. And it looked like this, it was green, 40 by 80 characters. And, and what am I talking about? Yes, literally, this was the computer. And at Stanford at that time, we had an IBM 360 mainframe to do computational work. and the terminals were connected with serial cables. They actually ran serial cables all through the buildings. And if you're fortunate, you had one of these nice terminals on your desk where you actually programmed. The IBM 360 mainframe at Stanford was used up to 1998. So yeah, so this was my use of the World Wide Web when it first came out. And this is actually pre-internet, believe it or not. Um, speaking of which, <laughs> internet, um, another thing that high energy physics is dealt with, and also um, uh, energy physics and, and the Department of Defense in the US was the internet system, was the, um, what we called HEP net or HEP net. And you know, this is a picture from 40th anniversary of what's called um, national uh, network in the United States. And you can see these, you can see this caption is kind of hard to read, dual 56 kilobyte. <laughs> and you can see the, the, the laboratories. So, you know, I was here at MIT. I spent some time also um, at Fermilab. Here's Fermilab. And of course, I spent time here at Slack. And so these are the major hubs. And, and as an undergraduate, I worked at MIT and it was quite amusing because we had this beautiful 5,600 um, kilobyte connection to Fermilab. And what MIT actually did is they rented satellite time <laughs> to get this connection. It was fabulously expensive. Okay. so. This is um, people at Stanford. So obviously, um, you know, using mainframes is not something that everyone can do at home. And soon after, graphical systems started coming up. And this is actually the Midas browser, which was developed by this person here, Tony Johnson, who actually sat in my desk, sat, sat about three offices down in the hallway, because two of us worked on the same experiment called SLD. Also in this picture is uh, Paul Kunz. Paul Kunz was famous for locking his door and smoking his pipe like crazy, <laughs> which I'm not sure was even allowed back then. And he uh, was a big proponent. You can see he's sitting in front of a Next computer. I don't know if you guys recognize the Next computer. That's what it actually looked like. And this is back when it first came out. You can actually go in uh, the Stanford campus and buy one of these machines. It was like ridiculously expensive, more expensive than the car. And over here is the head librarian which actually was the boss of my wife who was working at the library at that time. So, and this is what the browser looked like. No one's, no, no one's heard of this. I used it for a briefly, but soon after this browser was developed, Mosaic took over and that was the end of it. By the way, this is Motif, which is an X window standard, uh, predecessor of sort of the modern window managers you see in Linux these days. So this is actually my um, personal web page. I was looking at ones that are older, but um, they're too old even for the Wayback Machine. This is one that's dated uh, September 2000. Um, and back then, you know, these are actually handmade. And this is not really necessary. It was kind of a fun thing to do as a way of communicating yourself to other people um, uh, in, the, in the high energy physics community, which is basically what this is for. You do notice that I did teach a class in high energy physics uh, at Santa Cruz. And actually, I had a link here for uh, those students to get I guess, problem sets, because um, back then all teachers, all classes were taught on whiteboards. We didn't use um, presentations for that. Um, and this is a picture of me, which is really grainy, actually at N Station A. This is N Station A behind it at Stanford. And it's a really, really crappy picture because back then you, you don't just dump one megabyte pictures on the web because people were phoning in with their 56k baud modems. You don't, you didn't do that. So this was extremely compressed to it's almost unrecognizable. And this is me when I was a lot younger. And this is my dosimeter um, because this is a radiation area. And, um, everyone at, at that in that point in high energy physics was basically using X Windows thin clients connected to Linux to to Unix mainframes. Only later did we start moving to Linux workstations, which we mostly used actually as thin clients to log into the big machines we had access to. 
Um, this is actually, yes. So I actually reconstructed this from the Wayback Machine. And this is my code I wrote by hand. And I give all these like friendly comments like, yeah, where do, this, where do these reptiles come from? This is kind of cute reptile background. And I talk about where it came from. Someone at Caltech made it. I have no idea who this person is. And I talk about how to make um, my name, <laughs> right? this cool text. And it's kind of funny. This cooltext.com still exists. It's a little bit quaint. You can try it if you want. And I talk about how I make the background transparent because, of course, it would come with a white background. Um, and I'm making fun of Windows. Um, anyway, and some other comments about making things line up. So it's kind of cute to look at this thinking, I, I, of course, don't remember when I actually wrote this. A couple of things about this. You notice that everything is HTML. There's no CSS. Uh, CSS came a little bit later. It was mostly available, but most of us didn't know how to use it. Everything is specified explicitly, like the width and height. Um, here, I was very good about putting alternate text. And that was sort of important because there were still people using text browsers at that point. Um, and yes, here is my link page. And you know, um, off, well, most people had link pages because we didn't have Google. <laughs> so to find things actually was a bit of a challenge. This is Alta Vista. Some of you may have heard of this. This is the old Yahoo, which was categories. And, and Yahoo with categories actually had people going through and making explicit categories in a category tree, believe it or not. Um, this is an animated GIF. It's not animated here because this is a screenshot. Um, so let's move ahead seven years. And this is where I left high energy physics and joined a company and started working on web technology in a, 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 in a um, commercial setting. This is for internal tools. And I actually looked this up. Turns out we have our uh, subversion uh, repository going back um, almost 15 years. Here's a, here's a deposit I made 13 years ago. And this is written in Perl. It's a Perl CGI script. This was extremely common back then, where you simply had Apache that would execute a shell script. And the output of your shell script to see the print statements is the web page. And, and you know, this, is, this is horrifyingly bad code, <laughs> because you notice I'm taking a parameter uh, directly and inserting an in HTML, which is like a giant big no-no with, no, um, with no escaping. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. And also, some of this is just bad, you know, a mixture of, of code that's templated and code that's explicit. So anyway. But you know, I actually knew Perl uh, as a high-energy physicist. I didn't really use Python. So this was a natural thing for me to start with. But later on, oh, yeah, I should mention, <laughs> what's this thing with, with CGI? I, I, you, people must know about CGI, but it was the way to do things back then, executables. And you can actually still find in the Apache documentation these horrible things where you can allow people in their home directories to actually have CGI scripts. And in the old days, they would be executed by root. And so you actually had a situation where you allow users to insert scripts in their home directories which can be executed by root when they're visited by someone's web browser, which is like horrific <laughs> security violation. And this was actually quite common. Um, Unix is was never a very good secure operating system. This book, by the way, the Unix Haters Handbook, is now publicly available. If you're interested in a little bit of history and a little bit of a laugh, I suggest you take a look at this link and find this book. Um, it's really very funny. And you will learn, for example, why, in, and if you look at the raw text of your mail, your mail messages sometimes have these strange symbols inserted. It's really very amusing. Um, anyway, uh, later on, um, I switched to Python. And this is like better CGI. It's still a CGI. It's still shell encrypted, scripted, except now we moved to mod CGI. So the Python interpreter was put embedded in Apache. So you avoid the startup costs. And here you can see I still using um, in, in, in uh, templates for HTML that's actually in the code. And this is something I like doing because I really did not like external templates because I wanted the code you're using to be connected to what you're actually seeing on the screen. Uh, later on, I learned that my mechanism, my, my uh, system design for this page is actually something called Roca, <laughs> which means it's basically very, very restful, very, very simple, and very elegant. And this actually suits this application very well, which is a laboratory information system. And it's still uh, in basic use um, today. Although 
recently, around 2016, I did migrate to uh, central routing. You can see this uh, pyramid scheme. Um, still separate scripts, but at least now in a in a real framework, and moved to um, Python 3, moved to Pyramid, and ultimately it's now deployed using Docker, Dockerized, uh, using T Unicorn, using uh, proxies, and a very modern deployment. This is what one of the pages actually looks like, if you're curious. Um, now, <laughs> by the way, you know this is uh, this is in, um, developed in Linux. For the longest time, I've been looking for a decent code editor, and it, it's it only recently that I actually find one I finally liked, which is uh, Visual Studio Code, um, which brings up the question about when Microsoft finally actually became cool. <laughs> um, Visual Studio Code, of course, is written in uh, Electron, which is actually JavaScript. Um, and then finally, also, um, uh, we actually developed new tools. This this tool is for the clients of our company, the laboratory people. This is an internal research tool. And for this, we just started from scratch using all the modern tools. And this is where I learned about React, Redux, uh, Webpack. And uh, the back end of this is a Flask API um, and Python. Um, and so one thing I want to mention about React is, again, uh, HTML integration, because you have HTML actually written in your script. Um, and one thing about Webpacks I really loved is that I can finally put comments in my JavaScript. Because for those of you worried about performance, you don't usually put extraneous things in your JavaScript because it's served. In this case, you're welcome to put all nice comments. In this case, this code is so well written and you don't really need many comments. Um, this is kind of nice. I really fell in love with JSX because basically you're building the HTML page in your actual code. Um, just a little bit about this a little bit about software engineering and coupling. So the one thing that really annoys me about these templates is you have code that accesses template a very a template file in a separate place, oftentimes a very separate directory. And me, this is uh, annoys my sensibilities. This is why JSX is really nice because you're actually doing uh, the, the HTML all properly constructed and escaped actually in the code. And to me, this is a huge, huge win for maintainability and reliability. And you start asking yourself, why were CGI uh, so successful? It's because it's very much like this. Why was PHP successful? PHP is a horrible language. It became successful because it's the web page that you're actually coding in. Um, and it's not, I don't think, an accident. And you ask yourself, why did JSX do this? I think this is actually very, very deliberate and actually very smart. Um, a software engineering number two, uh, I call this referential transparency. Basically, uh, you have stateful objects. So you update a React component, you alter a property, which means you alter its state. This is actually a pretty severe limitation on how you write code. And the question is, why did they do that? They did it for a very good reason, is the idea of state. State being very important. And I think in, in particular, when we talk about JavaScript, um, the, the, the fact that JavaScript runs asynchronously is a source of a lot of confusion, especially for junior programmers. And if you reduce the asynchronous nature of JavaScript to the, to the idea of states, you make it much more tenuable to understand what's going on. And I think you know those of you who are working in JavaScript can really appreciate this. So that's what I was talking about. And I want to conclude with you know, the story, the, the idea behind the story is basically technology is not created in a vacuum. And I mention this because I think it's important for those of you thinking about innovation and what comes next is what, what can we learn about how technology arose in the past to try to understand what technology is going to arise in the future. Um, and the web was born from a very specific technological need. It's since moved into a very commercial space, but there's a reason why it existed. And there's a reason why bad tools become popular. <laughs> and I, I'm going to say that good tools um, support good practice. And that's it's, my talk. It's, it's amazing uh, to see how it developed uh, through years. Uh, I, was, I, have, I have one first, uh, first question to you. Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you actually uh, mentioned that PHP is a, is a horrible uh, technology. And at the same time, that technology does not um, 
is not created in vacuum. So, uh, do you think, do you think, um, it, in our uh, in our world now, is it easier to create great technology, or is it harder because of the leg legacy w w which we have? No, it's obviously harder because of legacy. I mean, there's still PHP is still widely used, as you know. Um, and I think that even the authors of PHP kind of are, are horrified about what it's turned into. Um, you know, making, you know, making new languages, it seems like a new language appears every day. <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing to do, and there's a whole question of adoption. Um, yeah, good technology um, and good practices is hard to do, um, clearly. Otherwise, you know, we would have a lot better languages lying around, and we wouldn't still be uh, using uh, PHP. We still wouldn't be using... Um, well, I, I'm not a great fan of Java either. <laughs> Java, the the uh, original uh, uh, language, not JavaScript. So it's another example of where it's very hard. Um, on the other hand, things like Swift from Apple is a very good. I'm Swift. I, Apple's done a very good job with Swift, but does require a really clean break. And and Swift is only possible because there's a giant company behind it. Okay. Well, that's that, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so maybe maybe giant companies can create better uh, better languages, therefore, or maybe uh, it depends also on other factors. Like, I don't know, well, great. Apple forces you to sort of use it in some sense, and they go out and promote it. I mean, internal to Google, there there must be dozens of internal languages people have developed, sort of as a, almost like a hobby. Um, but you don't hear about any of them. Um, Microsoft came up with True TrueScript, which may you know, something is an improvement over JavaScript, for example, and they promote it. But it sits on top of JavaScript. So on the other hand, uh, technology like Webpack mm -hmm. allows you freedom to introduce new technologies like JSX with, without really imposing on all your clients to get new browsers. So this is at least one route to get to there. Webpack, of course, has its own technological hurdles, right, as we all know. <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, there is a joke that people on hackathons, uh, when they start, they they start usually with configuring Webpack, and in the half, in the middle of the hackathon, they finally configure it well. So, <laughs> so it works for them. No, I mean you, you, the usual thing to do is you take one of these example <laughs> examples and you start from there. And some of the examples are terrible. So um, <laughs> I, I actually encourage people to actually figure out how to use Webpack and build uh, like a React or Vue app from scratch. <laughs> You know, we actually make the directories um, rather than rely on a starter, a starter kit. Awesome! So yeah. great. Uh, there is a question from Daniel Janus. Have you ever personally met Tim Berners-Lee? Tim Berners-Lee? No, no, because you know he was at, at CERN, and and I, I only visited CERN on occasion. I've only been there for a few weeks. I work, I work mostly in other laboratories in high energy physics, which is kind of funny because in terms of high energy physicists, most people spend a lot of time at the CERN laboratory, but I actually didn't myself. So thank you very much. It was a great honor, David, again, to uh, to meet you. I will also- oh, my pleasure. Uh, I will also share your uh, uh, your uh, website later and, uh, and maybe sites if you, if you are access. And also the whole recording will be published soon on our YouTube with uh, yeah, with, with with some with some remake.